You are not going to want to miss this video with my partner and the CEO of my company, Blue Spruce Holdings. DJ Scruggs talks about the five things you need to know before you buy your next apartment building. So without further ado, here is DJ Scruggs. Please give him a giant round of applause. DJ Scruggs. Thanks so much. So I, I was noticing as people were introducing themselves, that we had a few lenders who started to feel like they were redundant, you know, because there's so many lenders here. That's okay. I mean, that's what I love about this business is that we can all work together. We can find ways to work together. Um, as, as Adam mentioned, my background was tech. I did 20 years of tech startups. And um, when I first got into real estate, I was hoping it would be the case. And it turned out to be absolutely true. It's a very community-oriented business. Um, you know, the, the term you might hear sometimes is coopetition. So sometimes you're competing with someone for a deal or competing with someone for a loan. But a lot of times you're just helping each other out, you know, whether it's, um, whether it's lending or finding contractors. I mean, it goes a long way. And I, I came to Adam's very first meetup. In was that 2016? In the 2016, like November? Yeah, I think. Yeah. In almost two years. Yeah, and there was six of us there, and three of us ended up becoming partners. So, and I started. I heard, I heard a few. There's a few newcomers here. That's how I, I, I didn't know diddly about real estate. I just thought mm, this sounds kind of interesting, and started going to meetups like this. And lo and behold, now I get to present at meetups like this. So. Um, what I'm going to talk about are the five things you must know uh, about getting into multifamily investing. Now, as you might imagine, these are five big things, but under each one of them is about a hundred little things. <laughs> so, so what I'm, I'm not going to pretend I'm going to teach you everything you need to know. I'm just going to give you some really broad brush outline strokes of, of what you should be thinking about. And also, I want to emphasize um, there's a lot of different skill sets involved in this. And I don't think I've met a single person who has them all. There's almost always at least a partner or two or three or four involved. So if you're thinking about getting into this and you're a little intimidated by all this information I'm going to throw at you, that's okay. Find a partner. And this is a great, a great place to, to do it. And that's where I found my partners. So just keep that in mind as we go through these. So before I do the five things you must know, I want to go let's see if I can get this thing to work. Oh, i got to turn it on. Let's see here. here we go. So I want to talk about the, the, the pros, like why you should be investing in multifamily in the first place. I mean, there's lots of different asset classes out there. We're going to be featuring, what, five of them at our September 22nd event, and that's there's dozens of them. So I'm just going to talk about why we like multifamily, and then maybe some of these will resonate with you, or they may tell you, ah, I don't want to do this. You know, that, that's totally valid. So um, number one is just the demographics. So we are at, right now in the United States, there are more people renting apartments than ever in its history. Um, the, the peak, you know, what you look at is uh, the ratio of, of owners to, to buyers. The owners peaked right around 2007 because everyone was able to, to get a loan and buy a property. Uh, I think they hit in the high 60s at one point. I don't have the numbers at my fingertips. But now we're closer to uh, the mid 50s, 50 percentages, what I'm talking about. So there's a lot of people who need places to live, and that's not something that's going to be uh, disrupted away with an iPhone app, right? People need a place to live, that's not going to change. Now, the way they live and the types of buildings they live in, that might change with, with trends and all that, but the demographics are really strong. A lot of times people talk about millennials, you know, uh, I saw a, a plug in for your browser that anytime the word millennial showed up on a website, it would change it to snake people. <laughs> so what do the snake people think about uh, multifamily? Uh, but one thing that hit me the other day is, you know, the oldest millennials are now in their mid thirties uh, and headed toward 40. So we can't sort of, we can't just sort of use the word millennial to refer to a bunch of uh, 21 year olds, you know, that they're part of it, but it's a bigger access class, uh, a bigger group of people than you might imagine. The thing is, the millennials are the, the biggest generation we've ever had. Um, I'm Gen X. We got kind of the short end of the stick because between you know we had the baby boomers above us and the millennials below us, and no one really cares about the Gen X people. But that's okay. I can still make money. Um, so another is uh, the scalability. So I heard a few people here have some rentals they own, 
And um, while I wouldn't say it's just as easy to buy a 100 unit building as it is to buy a four unit building, a lot of the work is the same. And so if you're putting all this time and energy into buying one place that's gonna kick off $200 a month, maybe you should look to something that kicks off $2,000, $3,000, $4,000 a month. Um, that, that's the possibility that you get for a multifamily. Um, and because, because it's so well understood, it's been around a long time, it's different from the typical get a 30 year mortgage kind of situation, but there's a lot of similarities in that the lenders all, um, they've done this, you know, they've seen a lot of deals. There's a lot of people like us who've seen a lot of deals. And so while it's not the same as buying a home, it's pretty similar in terms of uh, the ecosystem that's available to you to help you make good decisions. So another one is the passive income, and I put mostly. <laughs> um, if you are a, a deal sponsor, which is what Blue Spruce is, we, we, we find the deal, we find the money, we put it all together. Uh, what I tell people is, is a deal is not, if you think less about property being something you buy and more of it as an asset that you're manufacturing, right? There's a lot of things that go into it. Of course, there's the property, um, there's the equity capital, there's the debt capital, there's the property management team, there's your lawyer. There's a lot of different pieces of the puzzle. And people get intimidated. They see something cost five, 10, 20 million dollars. They think, I could never buy that. Well, it's true, you probably never could buy that. But you probably could put together um, a deal that uses all these pieces and, and completes the puzzle for you. So think of buying properties as manufacturing deals and, and less about buying something. Um, I, I, I do want to give a, an example of the passive income part. So as a deal sponsor, what I do, my job is I mostly focus on raising money and managing the asset. Now, management is not property manager. We have property managers on site. But you know their, their scope of what they can do is limited, and sometimes just random stuff comes, especially when you first buy a, a property. So this this isn't for multifamily per se. This is for a fourplex. I just bought. These are the keys to a um, the washer. They have the coin operated laundry, right? And I, I just bought this place, and I'm in the middle of rehabbing it, and I just got, as you can imagine, just 80 balls in the air trying to get this thing finished. And then someone said, calls me and says. Um, I can't put money in the machine. It won't accept my coins, right? So it turns out that the, the good news is because the coin box is full, right? So there's a big box about this big, just full of quarters, right? Bad news is this, the keys they gave me don't work. <laughs> so I was able to open one of them, but now I'm like trying to figure out how to open the other. And meanwhile, my tenants can't can't um, do their laundry. <laughs> so. So those are the, the types of little things that can drive you a little nuts. Now, in a multifamily deal, that would be something the property manager deals with. That's not, not my problem. But if the property manager doesn't do a good job, it becomes my problem, right? And so that's, that's a big piece of it as well, is understanding what, you, what are the levers you can pull to control um, the asset. Um, so the valuation method. So you know, a lot of people I know are looking here in Denver, maybe some of you are succeeding. <laughs> at, at uh, doing flips here in Denver. I don't know how. <laughs> I mean, it's very pricey here. And that bleeds over into multifamily as well. And so you've got a lot of sellers who think their property's worth a lot more than it really is. Um, and for that reason, we actually don't spend a lot of time looking in Denver. We, we, we've looked at a few deals here, but um, the, the key is, is the valuation method. So it's not, you're not competing with uh, maybe a husband and wife who want to buy that and fix her up or, and they'll, they'll overpay for it because they don't really know what they're getting into. With, with uh, multifamily, there's some basic um, metrics you look at. And you know, depending on the economy, some may go up and some may go down. Depending on the strength of the seller, maybe they're in a, a, a panic situation where they've got to unload this property. You know, that can affect it. But at the end of the day, you can, you can pull it back to numbers that are real numbers based on the real performance of the property. And that, that helped me, I know, a lot, just sort of having the confidence you know, to look at it and say, this is a bad deal and here's why, um, because the numbers don't make sense. Um, stability. So the great thing about multifamily too is even if, even if you're in a worst case situation and it's, there's a lot of people moving out, it still will probably cash flow. Um, you're not sort of in that situation where if you buy a single home and rent it out and they leave and it takes you two months to fill it, you've lost two months of income. Now, you've lost some income, 
but you have just a much more of a bedrock of stability there because most people on a given year don't move. And um, so you're not in a situation where suddenly you're having to pay mortgages uh, on things that are not producing income. Pretty much every property will produce uh, some good income if you use the numbers. I'm gonna talk about the numbers in a minute. And then um, you can leverage OPM. Does anyone know what OPM means? Yeah, exactly. Um, Adam has a, a, a phrase he uses for OP. You say OP's money, what else? OPM, OPT, OP everything. O mm -hmm. every, other people's time, other people's efforts, other people's experience, other people's knowledge, other people's money. I mean, a team is, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, this, does, this can be virtual. You don't have to have all these people working for you like on a payroll, right? You can assemble a team, you can assemble the money, the time, the expertise, and that goes into building, you know, manufacturing that asset. And uh, so I always say leverage OP, OPM because that's the most obvious thing and that's where I spend most of my time. But there's lots of O's out there um, that you can look to. All right, so let's get um, right into the, th the things you must know. So um, number one is just the market, right? And so what does that mean, the market? There's literally tens of thousands of of markets across the country, and so it can be a little intimidating trying to figure out where to even buy, number one. Um, but then, when you dive into it, you really need to know the sub-market, because, you know, sometimes one street just can divide a neighborhood, and they're paying 50% more on this side of the street than they are on that side of the street, right? So this is just a, a screenshot I did this morning uh, from Google. This right here, 25 Whittier, we actually own two buildings there, 25 Whittier and um, 31 Whittier. And this is a, in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Bridgeport is not typically on the list of places to buy. You know, it's, it's, you, you rarely see anyone talk about, yeah, come to Bridgeport and invest in real estate, right? So, but we did it uh, for two reasons. One is we like the market, and the other is honestly we just wanted to learn. Because as much as I can tell you and talk to you, and you can go to, classes and there's some really good ones out there there's nothing like having to do it and so this particular property which is just 16 units i mean i'm working for way below minimum wage <laughs> so far on this thing but w when did we put this under contract adam last was it august or september well let's it's probably been more than a year yeah it's probably been more than a year yeah so we put this under contract in august and it seemed like a pretty straightforward deal it took us eight months to close <laughs> and you know it was one of those things where every time my phone rang no one ever called me with good news you know it was always bad news we need to you know we need you to explain this or uh, oh there's some permits open that he hasn't cleared just all the typical nonsense you have to deal with but we learned a lot during that period and the reason we stuck with it is because of the market so what I want to point out here if I can find this is this 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 is Connecticut Turnpike right here, right? This area, this whole area, is called Black Rock um, in uh, Connecticut, in Bridgeport, and you can just barely see. It's actually right up against the ocean. There's a literally a yacht club down here. Um, all of these houses are super expensive, super nice. You know, in this little cluster right here, and then right along here, Fairfield Avenue. This is basically the hipster section of Bridgeport. Right, so this is where you find, you know, there's, uh, there's, here's the movie house, but you know they've got a cool. This is like a cool pizzeria place up here. There's a bunch of nifty little restaurants up and down here, and typically um, with a market, what you're looking at at a very macro sense is, is it growing? Are more people moving in? Are more jobs being created? And so on. And so Connecticut itself is shrinking. People are moving away from Connecticut except Bridgeport. Bridgeport has been growing steadily uh, for the last 15 years. It's not going to knock your socks off and grow like Denver grows, but it's grown very solidly. And everything we've seen is that's going to continue. I mean, what's interesting is that this line kind of divides the good part of Bridgeport from the not so good part, right? Um, but this is changing. I don't have a picture of it here, but if you sort of went down the highway about this far, you'd see these big old industrial uh, factory buildings there. Those are being converted into Class A um, condos, right? So we're basically betting that the stuff we see here is going to continue, and that more is going to continue up here. Oh, and by the way, there's a university 
right near here too. So there's a lot of reasons someone might want to live in this area. And it, it goes beyond just, well, is Connecticut growing or not? There's, there's lots of little things. So, so that's, um, I would say that's really one of the most important parts is to make sure you're not buying in a market that's flat or God forbid shrinking. Um, you want something where you're getting at least 2% growth in population and, and jobs. Won't always find that, but that's, that's kind of the, uh, the benchmark we look for. Um, and how do you find out this stuff? Well, there's a few different ways. So one of them is uh, the Milken Institute. Um, and they go well beyond real estate. So does anyone remember Michael Milken? Remember him? Yeah. He had a stint in prison for a while. Um, but he's a pretty smart guy, and he started this Milken Institute. And they do something called the Performing Cities List. Normally it's at the top, but I think it probably got cut off. But it'll say, but the Performing City List, they do this every year. They release it usually in the first quarter, you know, looking back over the past year. And they'll give you the top 100 cities in terms of job growth, and they'll break it out into different types of, you know, what are the top school cities for schools? You know, what are the top cities for um, new job growth? What are the top cities for friendly government? Because they look at that, you know, to see um, is it a business-friendly environment? And what we do when we started looking at this is it lists it lists 100 as sort of the main list, and there's another couple hundred below that. Top 20, we don't bother with. Top 20, Denver's you know, in that top five, probably, in terms of growth. Places like San Francisco, Seattle, um, and more recently, Charleston has moved up on that list. And so those are the places we don't bother with because we feel like they've already peaked. You know, They are at their peak. And maybe it'll continue for another five years. I mean, who knows with the economy? But um, it, it, we feel like... It, that's you're coming into a seller's market if you're going into a top 20 market but that leaves another 80 that you can go look at and you can look at things like is it moving right so if it was um number 54 this year what was it last year was it number 24 or was it number 84 right because that's a, that's a useful thing to know so this is a really comprehensive way to just in a very broad brush area look at what are the types of markets that are available to me and and use this as a point of departure one thing i'll add is um, when it comes to market, choose one that you can get to in, in a single plane flight. <laughs> That's um, Bridgeport is not like that. Okay? I mean, I take it back. I can get to New York, but then I got to drive um, through New York traffic. Um, to get there. So that's something you don't want to look at as well. So you may look at it and say, wow, the Loxie, Mississippi, that's growing great. But how many stops do you have to take to get to Loxie and then drive down, right? I mean, ideally, once you buy something, you have a property manager, you only have to visit it a couple times a year. Um, but still, if you've got 10 assets and you're doing two visits a year to each of them, that starts to add up. And, and you know, the thing about airline travel is it never gets better. I mean, it's just, my dad was a pilot and uh, it just never gets better. It's just always worse. It's one of those few things in society that just keeps going down. It's always worse. Um, so some other things about the market. Uh, so this is from CoStar, which is a paid service. Has anyone here ever used CoStar? Okay, so you probably know it better than I do. Th these are reports that we get. Uh, my partner, Manny, is able to get these. And so we look through these. And these are great because these will really, they focus on real estate. They dive down into the sub-markets, you know, where they recommend you should buy. Um, and you know, what's the median income, what's the outlook for the economy, all that. So these, these are excellent. And um, so that's when you, when you really want to drill down and you say, yeah, I kind of like, I'm hearing good things about Tulsa. What do I need to know about Tulsa? Which we've been doing, we've been looking at Tulsa. Look at the CoStar report and you can learn a lot. Um, it has average rents, you know, projected rent growth, all kinds of stuff. So that's the market. So number two, let's talk about how to value a property. Um, this to me was the, the most important thing for me to learn because I just didn't know. I don't know how to tell. Is this a good deal or not? Right. So we use um, we went through a, a training program, the RE Mentor program with um, Dave Lindahl. He has what they call the underwriting template. Underwriting is just analysis. That's all it is. You're just analyzing a deal. And so you look at it and you, you plug in the numbers. You know, these are the typical things you see: taxes, insurance, repairs, and maintenance, all that. And what we do is we take the numbers they give us and then we, we put our own numbers side by side. So you, you see it says yours here. What you don't see is there's another column over here that says theirs. Um, because sometimes, because sometimes we just don't believe them. You know, they're, they're saying repairs and maintenance are X, but it, it looks like there's a lot of deferred maintenance here. So we're going to bump that number up. Um, but sometimes it goes the other way. Like 
Um, we bought, um, where was it? I guess it was the Branson deal. We ended up, it was overinsured, if you can believe it. So we ended up saving about $10,000 a year right there, just in looking at the insurance numbers. So, so you come up with these numbers and, and you, you know, what you're really driving for is what is your net operating income? And I think this might be just a made up property. So don't ask me where this is from. Um, you look at that and then you have your CapEx every year. You're gonna put anywhere from you know, 200 to 500 a door into it. Or if it's a value add situation where you're buying a place that's got a lot of deferred maintenance, Maybe in your first year, you, you bump that number up quite a bit. Um, and, uh, and then you have your cash flow, and then you also have your debt service. And, you know, there's tools here that will help us, you know, plug in. This is what the loan amount is. Here's the interest rate. And so on. You can try different things. But all of that, what we're looking for is our cash flow after taxes. And then we're looking at some metrics down here, right? So um, one of them is cash on cash return. Does anyone know what that means? Yeah? Is anyone who doesn't know what it means? Nobody? Everyone knows what cash on cash means? Okay, good. Um, so we look for that number to be 12 or higher. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean we find it very often, but that's the number we look at. If you're getting a 12% cash on cash, then that means you're, there's enough cash flow that you can divide it up between yourself and your investors, and everyone feels like they're getting a good return, and you're making money as, uh, as the sponsor of the deal. Um, another thing we look at is debt coverage ratio. So what the banks want, or the lenders want, is typically 1.2. So debt coverage is basically um, how much more are you making than what you're spending on debt, right? That's what it comes down to. They, their number one goal is one. So they're looking at metrics like this to determine um, should we even loan to these people. So typically they'll say they want a 1.2. That's three comma 1.25. We look for a 1.6 because it gives you an extra margin of safety in there. Um, and then the last one is the cap rate. That's probably the term people are most familiar with. You hear it a lot. Um, we look for an A cap. Like I said, we look for it. We don't usually find it. <laughs> so, so, but you know, when you see that, like if I saw this, if, if Brad brought this to me, I would be like, holy cow! You know, fourteen ca cash on cash, one point six nine eight. Let's do it. Except, um, you don't typically see those numbers in. B and C class neighborhoods. You see those in D class neighborhoods. And we don't want to buy in D class neighborhoods because those are, as you can imagine, they're not very good neighborhoods. The only people who own properties there are slumlords. And slumlords, they buy and sell with each other, right? They don't, they don't, they have kind of their own world they live in. And they're, they're the kind of people who are comfortable going and, you know, busting knuckles to make sure the rent gets paid, that kind of stuff. And we don't, we don't do that. And so if we find these numbers, there's a good chance it's in a neighborhood we don't like. So that's that's important as well. And I'll say that I guess something I should have listed as one of the items here is um, persistence. I mean, you gotta look at a lot of deals. I mean, we look at lots and lots of deals. And so it, it's easy to like do, go on LoopNet, find a couple deals and be like, oh, this is a terrible deal. Let me look at this one. And you do five in a row and they're terrible. And then you think, this, this sucks, I don't want to do this anymore. Well, for one thing, LoopNet is not a good place to look for things, it's kind of a dumping ground. You can find deals there, but it's a, it's a dumping ground. Um, of, you know, the broker, the seller typically wants more than it's worth. The broker doesn't want to hassle with it, they dump it on LoopNet and hope some sucker shows up and buys it. Um, all right, so further on. So the number three, this gets to kind of what I was talking about a minute ago, is how do you do the due diligence, right? So, um, what are some of the, I'm just going to throw this out to you, what are some of the things you think, like if I were buying or you were buying a property, what are some of the due diligence items you'd want to do for the property? Anyone have a suggestion? Yeah. Verify the income statement. Yes. So those who didn't hear it, verify the income statement, make sure the numbers are real, look at their bank statements, because um, they do a lot of creative accounting. Um, or they're a mom and pop and they do no accounting. You know, and it's just kind of well, this much money showed up last month, and this much left last month, but we don't really have any details on that. So that's a, that's sometimes running. Can anyone else think of some other due diligence? Yeah. Property inspection. Yes, absolutely. You have to do a property inspection, and you really have to do two of them. The first one is uh, can be done by you, and should be done by you or someone on your team. 
and you go walk the property, you look, you know, ideally you have a property manager in tow who either is the existing property manager or a potential new one you might want to hire. Because a lot of times in a value add situation, the biggest value is just hiring professional management. You know, they're just poorly run. And uh, so we'll oftentimes bring a property manager along. We'll go look in every single unit, right? Because you may have, you know, 80 that are great, but that 81st is a hoarder, <laughs> right? Um, uh, just a side note on this fourplex I just bought, um, I, was I wasn't able to turn one of the units as quickly because um, of bed bugs. <laughs> and roaches, you know, and it didn't find that out until about three weeks in. So, uh, but that's the kind of thing you'll discover if you're doing a, an initial walkthrough. And if so, if they have a hoarder, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You're probably going to want to try to get them out, but just that way you know what you're getting into, right? Now, that's the I guess you could call it the informal inspection. Then you want to get a professional inspector out there. Um, they'll typically won't do all of the units. They'll do some percentage of them, like twenty percent. Just to find, see if they find any trends, um, like the wiring is bad, or boy, these these places are all full of roaches, you know, things like that. Um, anyone else think of some other due diligence items? Yes. Per unit expenses. Yeah. So, so that gets back to verifying the income statement, right? Is what is the what is the cost to keep this unit up and running, and what does it cost me when I lose it every month? You know, if someone moves out, you know, that's a useful thing to do. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll throw out a couple others that um, are useful. One is to call the local economic development board and just ask them, hey, what's happening around here? Um, are things moving in the right direction or, or not? Uh, and they may tell you about you know new development that you didn't even know about, you know, it's planned for next year or whatever. So that's kind of more like market due diligence, but it, it, it's really useful. Um, another could be, um, I'm drawing a blank. Oh, is is um, verifying um, the capex that you might expect? So we have a rule of thumb we use for capital expense about four hundred dollars a unit. Um, but you want to find out like what did they spend on capex last year, and see if that number jives with your number. And if they spent a lot less, then you're probably going to have to raise it. Your, your expense, because there's just a lot of deferred maintenance there, that kind of thing. Occasionally you get lucky, you get a property that's already been kind of repositioned and cleaned up, um, but usually not. So you're gonna to wanna to verify all those types of things. Uh, if there's any construction, you're gonna want someone, you're, first of all, you gotta find someone. <laughs> we all know how hard that is. Um, find someone to come and give you a bid uh, on the cost, because that factors in the total cost of the deal, right? Like we're looking at a deal right now in Tulsa, that we had an initial construction budget on, um, and we finally got a formal construction budget, and it was literally twice as much. Um, and it wasn't $10,000 twice as much, it was millions of dollars twice as much. <laughs> so you're gonna wanna do that kind of thing as well. Don't just assume that you can spitball it. And then and then you, you probably wanna go even deeper into the local things like, uh, like Tulsa, most people don't know this, but Oklahoma gets a lot of earthquakes. You wanna know that? Um, it's been going on for about the last 15 years. For a long time, they were just kind of dormant, but it's been, every year there's more and more earthquakes. And they think it's because of wastewater from mining operations. Um, the government for a long time just, if the mining companies liked it, good. You know, that was, that was the, basically how they, they did everything. But finally, people, these earthquakes were getting out of control and people started complaining and so they've been reducing the amount of wastewater, I don't know exactly what the formula is or how they come up with it. The number of earthquakes does appear to be going down at least in the past year, but that's just one year. Who knows what it'll be next year. And there was, a, there was an earthquake in Tulsa back in April, like a 4.4, which I think is probably just enough to kind of uh, rattle, rattle the chandelier a little bit. So there's lots of local concerns that you, you need to dive into. Sometimes it's, and we had some problems on that property, the, there was some foundation issues. We couldn't tell, is it because of the earthquake? Did it just like shake apart? Or is it because of the sandy soil there? I mean, those are the, the types of, of things you want to drill into to find out exactly why something is, is doing what it is or, or why, what it should be doing. Um, so number four, how to raise money. How many people have ever raised money here for like a syndication or a startup or anything like that? Okay, not very many of us. So um, I did, as I said, my background before was tech startups. Raise a lot of money for that. And the thing about 
tech startups is um, it's all about the pitch because you're asking someone to give you money, half million, a million, five million, and then you're asking them to wait five years and maybe they'll get a return on that money because tech is just such a, it's a casino industry. Most, most businesses fail. So when I got into real estate, I was like, oh, we actually can tell a story of how you're going to make money in the next three months instead of the next three to five years or 10 years, whatever it takes. So, um, so that was, to me, I loved it. I was like, this is, this is right in my wheelhouse. And so it turns out there's really just a few things you need to know when it comes to raising money. So one is you need to understand the SEC regulations. You don't have to be a lawyer. Um, it's not that hard to understand. It's the kind of thing you can learn in a, in a couple hours. And uh, you can get a securities attorney anyway. So if you're ever not sure, you can always just ask your securities attorney. Um, but, but basically what those come down to, the regulations basically revolve around who can invest in terms of net worth? Like, do they have to be an accredited investor or not? Um, what, if any, relationship do you have with this this person? So I can't just stand out on the street and wave a, a deal pack and say, who wants to invest? You know, that doesn't work. I have to have an existing relationship with them. Um, and then if you're raising money for other people, which we, we've we started uh, making that available to people, the idea that you can help us raise money and we'll compensate you in the deal, there's certain rules about what you can say and you can't say. You know, you can't go out there and really, you can't talk anything about uh, performance or, or guarantees or anything like that. You can just talk a little bit about the asset and um, and then you have to turn it over to someone who's a principal in the business to, to close the transaction. So that's, that's a big part of it. Um, and then how to package the deal, which is, um, I think, critically important, critically important. And it, it, it goes beyond like, is this a good deal? It's, are these people who are offering this deal, are they trustworthy, right? Are they, do they seem to have their act together? Can they answer, you know, random questions? Because you get a lot of random questions. You know, when was the roof last inspected? You're like, uh, I think five years ago. That's not a good enough answer. You gotta know, you gotta have that answer at your fingertips. And so you package all this stuff into a deal package. It can be anywhere from 25 pages to, to 50. And I'll show you an example in a minute. And um, once you package it, now you gotta go out and start finding investors. How do you do that? There's lots of ways. One is coming to meetups like this. I mean, we've definitely found inv investors this way, whether it's at our own meetups or other meetups. And um, just talk. I mean, the thing that we, the, the shift for me that I had to make coming from the startup world is typically we would raise money and hate every minute of it. Because <laughs> people in startups, they wanna go build their product. They don't wanna, spend time pitching investors, right? You finally get the money and then you go work on it for a year or two and then hopefully you've made some progress and you come back and you do it again. With this business, it's a constant, constant thing. We are always raising money, even if we don't have a deal. If you're interested in investing, I wanna to talk to you, I wanna learn what your goals are and get you on my list for when we do have a deal. It's just a, um, because you'll find, you know, at closing you'll get a lot of people who say, yeah, I'm in, but a bunch of them will change their mind for whatever reason, um, sometimes it's just they got cold feet. You know, uh, some some investors you know, they don't they don't want to invest with anyone that they haven't uh, engaged with for at least a year, right? So, fine. You know, if that's your personal rule, I'm, I'm happy to abide by that. Let's have a conversation now, and maybe in a year you, you want to invest. But you get a lot of investors who um, some of them don't have the money they, they think they do, and that could be just for logistical reasons, like oh, I was selling a house, I thought it would be closed by now, but it's not, so I don't have the cash. Um, so you should expect that quite a few people will say, yes, I'm in, and then they won't be in. So you have to over-raise, and that's why you need to always be finding investors. And um, uh, that was, that was a, a hard lesson we learned. <laughs> there was a couple times when it got down to the wire, we were like, oh man, we need $200,000. But thanks to Adam, he who has, he knows everyone in the Denver area pretty much and beyond, he, he worked the phones and we were able to find that money. Um, so it's a never ending process. And then how to present it. Uh, this gets back to part of this is, is uh, rules, you know, make sure you're not breaking the SEC rules when you present it. But it's also about investor psychology. So one of the things that we didn't learn until we had um, our second deal was in process. There's a lot of questions investors have that they won't actually ask you, right? Um, sometimes they, sometimes they, they feel uh, like they may not be informed enough, you know? So 
yeah, I want to invest in this thing, but have, but have they done their due diligence, right? And so they may have that gnawing voice at the back of their head, you know. And so you have to tease that out from them, um, get them to tell you why. Um, you also, the, the, the overarching question that everyone has that they never ask is, when do I get my money back, right? I'm going to give you my money. I hope it makes some money. I hope it returns 8, 10, 12% a year. But I just want to make sure I get that $100,000 back. And when do I get it back? So that's the kind of thing we address at the very front of our um, presentation. Now, we don't talk about the property or anything. We just say, look, here's what you should know. If, if, if you can't afford, or, or afford is not the right word, if your financial situation is such that you can't park fifty, dollars $100,000, $200,000 into something for five years, and get quarterly cash distributions, you should not be investing in this deal. Right? Just plain and simple. Um, but but most people, they, they do want to invest, they have the resources, but they have this nagging question in their head, when do I get paid? And so we always answer that before we do anything else. Then we jump into, uh, here's the property, here's where it's located, here's why we like it, here's uh, the plan for construction or whatever else we might, might have. Um, Sometimes people we'll ask for additional due diligence items, so we'll, we'll send those over as well. Um, but the, the most important thing is when are they going to get their money back? That's what they want to know. Um, let's talk about if this will work. It's decided to not work. Let's do this one. There we go. So this is just an example of a deal package to give you a sense. Uh, and I've only got, this, this is part of like a 35 page deal package. So I'm just gonna show you a couple things. Um, so first you can see it looks professional, right? It, it, it made the effort to have a nice color scheme and they've got this nice logo down here and uh, you know, just a very basic summary. You're getting a 98% occupied 76 unit multifamily property, class B. Built in 1984, that's what that means. Uh, and then a nice picture of the property, because people still, they want to see it, you know. No matter what, how good the deal is, people, they want to see the property. So as many pictures as you can include uh, are useful. And then um, you have to get into the nitty gritty of the numbers. He's got probably a dozen slides like this in his. Um, in this particular case, he's talking about investors' returns. So if we sell in year three, you know, here's what we think the cash is going to be, and uh, here's going to be your annualized cash on cash return. And, you know, this is what they're targeting is year five. Um, but, you know, sometimes we, we do that for our standard rule is five year hold. But sometimes an opportunity comes up to either sell ahead of schedule um, or it may take a while. You know, sometimes you want to list something for a year. So we're going to start looking to sell in year five. And if not listed immediately, at least start putting out feelers and getting uh, brokers to tell us what they think. Um, so again, th th there's a lot of subtle communication happening here that's beyond the numbers. Um, so one is it's, it's very professional looking, looks very nice. These guys, let them, you know what they're doing. Um, I found that this kind of stuff can be a little overwhelming. Um, a lot of investors, you know, it's just like just the sea of numbers and they're trying to uh, make sense of it. So we don't do as much as these guys do. Oops, decided to work again. Um, we don't put all these year, year three, year four, year five. We do some of this internally ourselves just so that we can mo model it. But in our experience, most investors don't want to see that except when they do. So, you know, you need to have it at least ready because some investors really want to dive into the numbers. You know, they want to ask all kinds of questions about the numbers. So um, I would say the most important things are a professional presentation, lots of pictures, detailed but not too detailed numbers, and then uh, really the last part I'll get to, which is um, you have to de demonstrate credibility in this business. And what do I mean by that? So. So unlike with um, most MLSs, there's no true multifamily MLS out there. And it's not like with a uh, single family where you can just pretty much, let's go take a look and you know, I'll give you an offer tomorrow, that kind of thing. No, they, they don't want, they, here's what they do want. They want people who can close, right? And when you're selling a $5 million property and someone shows up, looks like they've only got five, $5 in their pocket, you're not going to waste your time with them. <laughs> 
And so you have to, to create uh, this sense of, yes, these guys and gals, they will get this deal closed. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. Now, the, the best way is to already own a thousand doors, two thousand doors, right? Then you're, you're instantly proud. Well, they don't really care. Um, but in our case, we're, we're relatively new. We only own, own about a hundred doors. So we have to show credibility in other ways. Um, the, the first way, of course, is to learn one through four that I talked about. So that when you're talking to a broker, you can use the lingo and you know ask intelligent questions. Now, that still only gets you so far because because brokers. They have their preferred buyers. They already know people who can close, and so typically they'll show a deal to them first. And then, uh, but if you keep showing up and keep showing credibility, eventually they'll start to open their um, kimono a little bit and show you more. Um, but so I talked about knowing one through four. Can people think of some other ways to to develop credibility? <coughs> yes, sir. Get somebody on your team that's thousand Yes, that's a that's a big boost if you can get that. Yeah, so, um, and I talk about this in, in a slide here in a minute, but yes, getting someone on your team, can anyone else think of another way? Uh, maybe you could attract someone like that. Uh, how about an advisory board on your website? Yes, that was the next slide. So this is the social proof part, right? So if you can get a partner who owns a thousand doors, um, that goes a long way as well. Now, these are people, some of you may know, most of them are here in, uh, Allison's in England now, right? Yeah, well, she was here. And uh, Jeannie's in, um, Boston. Um, now, this doesn't mean they're all partnering on all of our deals, right? This basically means we take them out to dinner once a quarter, we get their feedback on different strategies we're trying, um, get their ideas, and uh, learn as we go, right? And so, having to, I, I was really surprised when I came to real estate because you see this a lot in tech. You know, you'll have a cool tech startup, some, some kids out of MIT are building, and they've managed to connect with a big shot investor or someone who's successfully built other companies. And it's just a way to, to prove that, yeah, we're serious and we work with other serious people. And it, it's just a, a nice little way to communicate, you should want to work with us. Okay? So these are just a couple examples we came up with. I'm sure there's a lot more. Um, if you really sat down and thought, what is some way that um, I can stand out and look more credible? And we actually even had a deal, we ended up not doing it, but we, we got a deal under contract for lower, for less than the, another bidder. And he said the reason he went with us is because of the podcast. You know, he's like, ah, oh, you guys really know your stuff. And so I'd rather sell with you. I know you're not gonna screw around. So the credibility, it comes a lot from those first four, you know, learning all these things. But credibility itself is, is important. And any way you can sort of show that you're credible, even if you don't own a thousand doors, um, you can talk about your existing real estate. If you own a bunch of rentals or you've flipped a hundred houses, things like that, that's good. That's a good way to demonstrate proof. Um, and speaking at events like this, I mean, we've done, we've made a concerted effort not only to run our own events, but also to speak at other events just to get us in front of people and, you know, show a little bit of what we have. Um, so that is number five. And so, how about um, some questions or comments or feedback? Are you, is your advisory board uh, like uh, mentors or just anybody that has your your back in the professional world? Or? Yeah, it's. I, I would say it's mentors. Um, if um, you know, if you have someone who's a, who's a big name, like an athlete or something, you know that can that can help. But we prefer someone who's in our industry in some way. Maybe they don't, maybe they're not a deal sponsor, maybe they're a, a, a fanny lender or something like that. You know, that would be one way to, to do it. But I, I was surprised, like I said, you know, tech startup, this is very common. You don't see this much in real estate. And so we made a concerted effort to reach out to people, say, hey, we like you, we'd like to spend time with you and, and learn from you. And, um, you know, we have five who came on board. And we'll probably continue doing that. You know, it doesn't have to be upset. At, at five, people may want to join, some may want to leave, any number of reasons. There's no real responsibility to the advisory board except just to come have dinner with us every now and then. There's no legal um, liability or anything associated with that. Any other questions? Wow. <laughs> you were very it's up there. Oh, oh, uh, oh, thank you. Thank you. I'll ask a quick question. Yes, sir. Just about pitching investors in. Mm -hmm. and getting money. Um, are some of your investors or a lot of your investors already kind of 
saddened in the real estate realm? Like, do you understand the seven and a half cap versus you know, 10 cap in the value? Um, I would say no. Um, there's some who are, uh, you know, they do a lot of fix and flips. So they, they at least understand like how to think about real estate or they may own a dozen rentals and they want to go bigger. Um, a lot of, uh, I shouldn't say a lot, but we've seen quite a few come in who this is their first time investing. They know they want to do real estate and you know, they like us, they want to work with us and, and they're really asking us to teach them what we know. And we're happy to do that. We love doing that. That's why we do these kinds of meetups. Um, there's some who, uh, I've only had one who was super sophisticated. It was a guy, an ex-hedge fund guy. He's got tens of millions of dollars. And he looked me up somehow on the SEC website, the Form D, that you have to file whenever you do one of these um, unregistered offerings. And uh, he grilled me <laughs> with a lot of questions about how our returns work. Um, and, and it was great. That's I would say that's not typical. And then there's a tier. So. What we focus on is there's a tier of investors, people like you and me, who have a little bit of money, or maybe you've got a lot of bit of money, and you've already done a little bit of this, or you've decided that this year is gonna be when you finally do this. And, and by the way, that's what I did too. I, before I ever raised the money for real estate, I invested in, uh, you wanna know Jim Flynn? He's spoken at our <coughs> events. I invested in one of his funds. So that helped me learn a little bit about uh, what it's like on the investor side. But So you have uh, a group of people who are kind of DIYers, and then above that, I shouldn't say above, but adjacent to it, a, a bigger source of capital, let's put it that way, is family offices. So these are you know, billionaires who they have so much money they don't know what to do with it. And so they, they hire an advisor or even staff out a complete family office. And their job is to deploy that capital and, and protect the principal and make them money. Um, in my experience, and we go to, there's an event, there's several events every year, there's uh, Wilson Family Offices, they, um, they host these events, we've been to them, um, they're good, but it's, it's funny because uh, we're all playing the same game, right? There's people like me there trying to get money, and there's people there with money who don't want anyone to know that they have money. <laughs> and, and most of them, the ones that are sophisticated, they won't even invest in someone who hasn't it's not just one year, uh, but, but a full market cycle, right? They so say, come back to us in seven or eight years, um, we'll talk. But those people, they have a lot of money, you know, and some of that is overseas money, and they're not, they actually don't care as much about returns. They just want to park it somewhere. That's part of the reason California's gotten so outrageous, is all the Chinese money uh, that's come in there. Uh, and then the third tier, which we never have talked to, um, <laughs> is the, is the uh, what do you call them, private equity funds. Right, so they buy all kinds of stuff. They buy companies, they buy oil wells, they buy land, they do all kinds of things. And they're typically, just because of the nature of their business, is uh, they, they have to aggregate a lot of capital and then they have to push a lot of capital out. So, you know, if you're coming in and asking for $5 million, they just, they laugh you out of the room. They're, they want 30 million, 40, 50 million plus that they can deploy um, at a single time. So. Um, and those are a lot of times what you see building these skyscrapers here, you know, just parking huge chunks of cash and um, hopefully paying off in a few years. Um, so that, I would say that is a very broad brushstroke of the three types of investors. We like the, the group that we attract. We like working with those folks. We like helping people understand what we're doing and we especially like writing them dividend checks every quarter. So, yes, sir. Do you typically, for the people that invest with you and properties you find, are you typically looking for accredited investors, sophisticated investors, or both, or does it depend on the property? It depends on the deal. So the first two, we, so there's, um, I always mix them up, there's 506, is it 506 or 503? 506. 506B. 506 506B, this, this is the SEC code, right? So 506B allows up to 35 unaccredited investors, but you have to have a relationship with them. So you can't just run an ad somewhere and get someone's money, right? Um, and in fact, you can't advertise it at all for those kinds of things. Um, and then there's 506C, which is only accredited investors. Um, and you can advertise. Uh, you have to verify that they're accredited. So it can't be just they checked a box saying they're accredited. You have to get a letter from their accountant or something like that. Um, so our first two deals, we did the B. And the only way I remember B from C is Adam has a mnemonic, which is B stands for buddies. So you can get your buddies together 
to go invest in something even if they're not accredited. Um, C is for accredited. We're, we thought we were going to be doing this deal in Tulsa, and I'm not so sure. But if we do go forward with that, um, then that will be accredited only. Yes, Kelly. I understand the, the definitions of 506B and 506C. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I'm still confused as if I meet somebody so far, 506B, if I meet somebody at a meetup mm -hmm. or an event or whatever, and we're talking real estate, I mean, what can I, you say I can't advertise, but can I say to that person, um, my team does multifamily syndications, mm -hmm. let me send you, a, can I show you a deal packet, a sample deal packet, mm -hmm. can I say that? And no, can I ask them if they, are, if they are a creditor or an accreditor? So, B, you can't, you're, you're not trying to promote it. If it's a B and you meet somebody, there's no way they can be in your next meeting. You can talk, you can be friends, and maybe one day you can invest together, but you can't just like say, hey, you, you're not accredited. Okay, well, let me just send you a deal packet so you can see what we're doing. You'll get in big trouble for that. The, the, I mean, I, I feel really um, ambivalent about talking about this at all. This is the kind of thing a securities attorney should be talking about, not me. Um, there's some rules of thumb, but they're not real rules of thumb. Some people say you have to have at least three meetings, so you can talk to the meetup and then go have coffee with them and then go have lunch, and then that's when you can show them a deal. Um, the, the problem with this kind of stuff, with these legal issues, is the SEC doesn't issue guidelines. They only react to events, right? So if you called the SEC and said, hey, if I do three meetings, this person invests, is that legal? And they say, well, I don't know. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. The only way they find out is if someone takes you to court. Right, and then it's ruled on. Now, one great thing I, I forgot to mention at the very beginning about multifamily, family, um, it's very stable. And so you're not gonna get foreclosed on in most cases. Um, at its peak, um, the foreclosure rate of multifamily was just, it was like 0.09 or something like that, percent, just under 1%. Whereas single family was five times higher, like four and a half percent, something ridiculous. Um, now, that the economy's in good shape, the foreclosure rate of multifamily is like 0.02%, and the foreclosure on single family is like 0.07. So it's still, even though it's much lower from the, the uh, at the peak of the crisis, it's still <coughs> buying a single family home is about four times more likely to get foreclosed on than buying a multifamily. So the reason I bring that up is, yes, the SEC won't tell you what to do. They let courts decide that. If you get sued, you did something really wrong. <laughs> Right, because this is one of the most stable asset classes in the world, and a lot of people want to invest in this, these kinds of properties, and so um, and a lot of people want to live in them. So if you're just managing it reasonably well and not doing something hinky to screw the investors, um, it's you know it's not going to be a problem. Now that doesn't mean don't you know follow the law, act within the law, but just sort of understand the way the SEC works. They're never going to really tell you. What constitutes the existing relationship? Yes. Not having ever invested in multifamily, mm -hmm. my question is: When you're talking about the SEC, mm -hmm. is there a minimum number of units when you have to worry about this? Like, if you just buy a four unit or a six unit, do you have to worry about all this SEC stuff? Um, well, so multifamily is typically defined as five and above, five units and above. So if you're under four. And even as, I, I can't remember, maybe it's five, maybe one of the lenders here can tell me. If, if you're four or under, you're, it's, it's just like buying a house. You know, you, you can get friends together to go in on it, but it's, you go get a mortgage, um, whether it's a you know, short term or a long term. It's really, it's, it's, you're working on the same guardrails as they use for houses. When you get to a, a five or above, now you're a commercial building and uh, typically you pay higher rates on the loan, there's a lot of different products available depending on what it is you want to do with the property. Um, so, the, the, the um, again, I'm not a securities lawyer, but you'll hear sometimes what's called the Howey test of something. And so a Howey test basically means people pulling money, this is based on a Supreme Court case back in the late 40s, I think. Um, there was a, was a group of people who, um, they bought an orange orchard, orchard you know, in California, and then they sliced it up into pieces and sold off, you know, they said, you're not buying stock in a company, you're buying a piece of real estate, right? And the thing is, the deal sponsors, they actually managed all that. So 
whether this, these oranges produced and made money was still they're the ones running it. You don't you're not coming out there picking oranges yourself, right? And so apparently they were very bad at it because they got sued. And um, what the Supreme Court ultimately ruled is if you're putting money into a common enterprise and you are not directly involved in the management of that enterprise, then that is a syndication and it has to follow SEC guidelines. But if it's just two of you buying a, uh, a 10 unit together and you're going to take turn, you know, one person's going to manage the property, the other one's going to do the bookkeeping or something like that, then you're fine. But if it's just like, give me some money and I'll send you a check every few months and you won't have any visibility into how this property operates, you're, you're in syndication territory. Give me another one. Well, if you want to get into all this, mm -hmm. what kind of attorney should you hire? Would it be real estate and security? Let's well, say you don't know anything about the SEC. Right. Would you go to a real estate attorney? No, who would then no you would go to a securities attorney. Um, typically, we have two attorneys involved in every transaction. There's one who's representing us uh, with the seller in terms of all the contractual stuff that goes with that. Mm -hmm. They have their expertise, and you know it's kind of local. Every different, every state has different rules, um, and then you hire a securities attorney to, to do the syndication. Um, for the most part, that is covered by national law, um, so it doesn't matter. Like our securities attorneys out in California, but they've done deals all over the country. Um, there are some little exceptions with each state, depending on the type of deal you're doing. But if you're doing 506 B, 506 C. You just need a securities attorney. You don't need a, a local representative. What well, if you don't know, though? I mean, I'm brand mm -hmm. new at this, so I might want to meet some people and say, hey, let's go buy a five or six unit thing, and I don't know anything about any of this. Mm -hmm. What kind of attorney would I, would, and say I go to a real estate attorney, mm -hmm. would they be knowledgeable enough to say you need a security? They should be. Okay. Yeah, they'll ask questions like, how, how do you want to structure this? Who are the investors? What are they going to do? What are their jobs? And if, you know, if, you, if one of them is, if you say to them, well, this person's not going to do anything. They're just going to invest money. He's probably going to say, you need a securities attorney to do that. So um, that's where to start. I mean, the, the place to start, honestly, is um, get some training. <laughs> right, whether it's through a, a mentor or a coach or going through one of these workshops. Uh, I mean, I'm getting, like I said, I'm painting some very broad brush strokes here. Um, I'm uncomfortable getting too detailed and telling you exactly what you should do. You know, I think that's something that takes a lot of interaction with someone who really uh, understands this deeply. Yes, sir. One question about investing. Can you crowdfund? Uh, you can. Um, that gets into a different regulatory um, area that I'm not super familiar with. There's regulate. There's some that are geared more toward just like raising money for companies and the cap, like how much you can raise, and you know who can you know, can they be accredited or unaccredited? They, they will actually allow unaccredited, but there's limitations on like you can't sink your entire net worth into a single investment. They won't. That, that's illegal. Um, there are a lot of crowdfunding real estate platforms out there. Uh, the ones I, I've looked at several of them. They all seem pretty good. I mean, I'm sure if I got into details I'd find pros and cons of each of them um, But the thing they all have in common is they don't want to talk to you unless you own at least 50 million in real estate You know because they have a, a base of investors and they don't want to be sending out emails for unexperienced operators So some of them are even 100 million. So so for us. It's like well, okay. Well, wait till we get to that level and then we'll look at it more seriously any other questions? All right. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Enjoy the lunch.